Hello and welcome to the Solo Grognarn. This is Eric. Today I'm going to do a, a short uh, review, D-Box, component review, overview sort of thing of France 1944 by Victory Games. So made in 1986. This is an interesting, it's an interesting title, I'll put it that way. Uh, for me, personally, and also generally for that matter. So I'll just uh, start by just saying this was uh, made by Victory Games, which used to be an ancillary of Avalon Hill. And this one was designed by Mark Herman. So this is sort of an interesting game for me on a personal level because this is in fact, the first proper war game that I bought. Um, well, not counting Axis and Allies. But, uh, yeah, when I was first looking for uh, to buy my first war game, I was uh, looking for something in a topic that would interest me. So, see France 1944, that quite interested me. I was... Uh, always rather interested, even as a kid, about the uh, uh, Northwest European campaign during World War II. And so this sort of caught my eye. I remember I was poring over many different war games in a couple of different shops back in the days when shops had many different war games in them. Uh, that's uh, not the case anymore, obviously. But uh, this was in 1986, and uh, this one caught my eye because of, like I mentioned, because of the uh, subject matter. But in addition to that, I was also, while well, being the rather analytical uh, type of kid and really, really wanted to make sure I got my money's worth which w with whatever I bought it, I wanted to make sure I got something that seemed a step up from Axis and Allies, but at the same time it wasn't something that it was going to uh, defeat me as it were. So I looked for something that was sort of lower on complexity. Uh, I knew I'd be largely playing uh, on my own. I really didn't have friends who had been into war games at all. It was really just a personal interest of mine because I have seen tabletop miniature type board games when I was very young and I was interested in them and then I got into uh, Axis and Allies and that sort of uh, made me decide yes yeah, I want to I want to see what I can find out about this hobby and so this was it so I went to the shop I bought this guy and inside this is what I found It was very uh, rather spartan in terms of number of pieces and everything. It's only got like what 130 pieces or so of counters. So it's a very low counter density. Pretty standard counters for victory games. That is to say, really packed with data and numbers in a fairly small half inch of uh, cardboard which was absolutely fine when you're 15 years old or for that matter if you're 25 years old but uh, for an older guy like myself it's uh, a little bit more of a pain. I've come to have a deep appreciation for the 5 and, five and 8 inch counters lately. I like counters. So German counters as you would expect are normal German grey. Um, SS units are also in German Grey as well, so they're not particularly identified or set out. Allied counters, you have American American units represented by all green, British ones with uh, a red inset, Canadian units with a yellow inset, French units with a blue inset. Uh, there's also uh, the Polish 1st uh, Armored Division, somewhere here, there it is, and that is a white 
inset. So all the uh, units and everything that I studied up on when I was a uh, young and when it comes to the uh, European campaign are all there. Not they really quite interested me. And a few uh, system counters. The system counters, by and large, are made up of counters which will represent uh, units which have been taken losses down to the point of being down to cadre strength. Basically, uh, units for the most part are made up of uh, three. Uh, steps of uh, strength. First step is of course the uh, front side. They take a step, you flip them, and then they take another step, then you uh, put on this cadre strength one. And then you have the map sheet. Pretty standard uh, victory games and for that matter. 80s types graphic. Colors are, well, they're honestly they're a little garish, but uh, they're not too bad. It's reasonably attractive, fairly functional. Um, all the charts you really need are on the map sheet itself, which is sort of neat, but then again, the reason for that is the actual play space only makes up less than half the map can see here. But that's okay. It uh, It's about as much playing space as you really require for this game with such uh, low counter density. So in comparison to these days it's uh, really nothing special at all but uh, in terms of what it was at the time it's quite, it was decent quite reasonably uh, attractive and uh, useful. And finally you have your rules book. Now one thing with victory games is that they have a tendency to have really thick rules books and uh, sometimes scenario books as well. But uh, this one is very lightweight for a victory game. It's the standard uh, approach to set up. Almost all the victory games are, uh, have a very similar approach in the way the rules books are laid out. And this is no different. Pretty straightforward. Verbose, perhaps, but uh, that's not a bad thing. It does make things a bit more clear, I think. And, uh, yeah, the whole thing uh, is done in a relatively small number of pages. Uh, this one here, this is an interesting uh, thing. Combat ratio computation table. This is something that I've never seen in any other game. So basically it is, uh, rather than uh, manually figure out uh, whether, uh, what sort of combat odds are 12 steps of attacker versus 5 steps of uh, defender, uh, this one it does it for you just by cross-indexing it. So in that case, you just have to look at, let's see, 12 steps attacker, 5 steps defender. That would mean that you're using the G, uh, the G uh, combat results table. So for when I bought this game, that was really useful for me, considering I was really quite mathematically challenged at the time. But... Uh, yeah, I came to learn to compute things fairly quickly uh, thereafter, though. A couple things about the gameplay. <clears throat> gameplay is uh, rather dynamic in the sense that uh, each... There are various uh, headquarter units. These headquarter units are, are activated on a random basis based upon the based upon a uh, chip pull system. Now if a particular headquarters is activated 
it allows you to activate a certain number of units for that particular headquarters. So in this case, this is the US 3rd Army. With it, you can activate five armor units as well as five infantry units. So that, uh, that sort of gives you an idea of how that sort of works. So it, it does allow for a pretty dynamic way of going in the sense that uh, you may find that units are, uh, are, uh, may end up being activated uh, by different headquarters depending on the situation. You may find that the German units may, f may have multiple German chit pulls at, in a row or vice versa, more allied chit pulls in a row, which puts the other side in disadvantage. But uh, yeah, it does create for, uh, for a nice dynamic system. You really never know entirely well until you're down to the last chit or so as to whose turn it is next. Another thing, and this is the really most uh, controversial thing about this game, and that has to do with the combat results. Well, actually how units are activated to be more precise. Go and the combat results. So the way the units are activated is, let's say that you have a unit, you choose to activate it, you need to determine right from the right before you do any ac actions with it. You need to determine which of these uh, expenditure tracks you want to make use of. Now, the expenditure track that you can make use of is really dependent upon how many movement points the unit has in total, and whether or not it can attack in a certain track really depends upon its morale as well, or proficiency. I, actually, I forget which one it was. So I'll just sort of use this as a bit of an example. So let's say you have a unit that is, uh, let's say it has four movement points altogether, and it has a uh, morale level of, let's say, four. Okay, so with this one here, that unit can start out its activation by either moving two uh, two movement points or it can attack anything of at least a morale of two or greater it can attack at that point so let's say it moves next thing it has to choose which way it wants to go it can either use up the remaining two movement points and just use them up like that may choose to only use one movement point and next turn it can use, see if it can attack but with a level 4 morale this blue space means it would really only be able to attack if it had a morale of 6 so it wouldn't be able to attack there anyway so all it could do is move twice so really no different than that one uh, on the other hand it can choose this thing this level, this track here. So it may move. This is orange, which means it can morale of four has that. So let's say it moves, it can then attack. And it can, well, if it had more, more movement points, it'd be able to move again. But in this case, it's blanks, so it cannot move anymore. But if it had six movement points, it would be able to go another two more. So that's sort of how it works. So it's very does allow for it does require a certain level of planning before you even move units so that's sort of cool um, it allows for a certain amount of flexibility in terms of movement versus uh, combat so it, it's really quite uh, quite dynamic in that sense so it's not a not a traditional I go you go sort of situation um, yeah but here is where it sort of gets bit more iffy and that is the combat results table. Combat results table. Uh, basically what you would do is you would get the combat ratio result. So you get the ratio, let's say it's a 3 to 2 attack, and then you roll the dice, it's a 2 dice. Let's say you get a an 11. So that is 5. 
So this is result 5. So let's say it is a set piece combat, so let's say infantry units attacking infantry units. So with this, then what you now do is you compare the attacker morale with the uh, defender morale. So let's say the attacker had a gain of 4 and the defender's morale was say 3. So in that situation you have a D result. So what does D result? That means the defender loses 2 steps and the attacker loses 1 step. The other alternative is that the defender retreats and they both lose a step. So there's, uh, that's how that would work. Now here's the thing. In that situation, under a 3 to 2 attack, that 5 is actually the best result that you can get, as you can see here. There's no uh, uh, DE result, like Defender Eliminated result, or anything like, like that in a really direct sort of way. So in other words, everything is really quite muddied in terms of what the results are. So let's say you have that. So let's compare that same 3 to 2 attack and you roll a 2 instead. That would end up with the very worst result, theoretically. So let's say again you had the attacker 4, defender at uh, 3. So that would be, that would have been a B result, the very worst thing that could happen. In a B result it would have been attacker and defender each lose one step. Or the defender retreats one and the attacker just loses a step. So that's really what it's about. That's really the most con controversial thing about this game is the fact that the combat results table is really is really flat in terms of the what sort of situation you can uh, find here. The very best result is really not much different than the very worst result you can get for in a combat situation. So, I mean, that is a thing that really, I know, looking at reviews and everything, that's what killed it for a lot of people. Um, I know that for me, when I first got this game and was first playing it, I really didn't know the difference because I was, well, I was new to the hobby and everything. So I just took it at face value and played the game. And I obviously, as you can see, it's been well played, worn out practically. Um, Units are well worn as well. But the thing is, though, I played a uh, game very recently for the first time in, uh, well, 30 odd years. Well, about 30 years, I guess. I played a game just uh, a couple months ago. And I found that the system is not my cup of tea. It's really not. I have heard a uh, a response made by Mark Herman uh, not too long ago, I guess about, well, not too long ago in all relative terms, about 10 years ago or so, uh, talking about uh, France 44 where he acknowledged that it's not everyone's cup of tea. And he described it as having accomplished what he set out to accomplish in terms of how the combat results table works. He, his opinion it is not broken in spite of what some have said and thought. It simply is what it is. It's doing what he, it's do, going according to his original vision of the game. Um, I think really what uh, he was saying is that in a situation where units are defending, most especially German units, when they defended and they were in a situation where they were being attacked by uh, Allied forces, including more numerous and more heavily units with more firepower and everything, the German units were tenacious when it came to the def when it came to the defense. But then again, it was the same thing on the other side as well. When the Germans launched occasional counterattacks whenever they could, such as at uh, the Bulge, they came across tenacious defense, which caused a great deal of casualties amongst the uh, the attackers. And really what uh, Mark Herman was getting at in this particular game is not so much a matter of 
it's not a matter of the firepower in and of itself being the cause of breakthroughs and the cause of uh, major uh, well victories such as they are when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to war. Uh, it really has a lot more to do with uh, simply having additional units in behind enough reserves and everything in order to be able to follow up on the initial battles and that's really where I was getting at. Um, I sort of see his point. Do I uh, like the design overall? Um, well, I'll put it this way. The game has a lot of nostalgia for me because it is my very first war game. I do not intend to ever sell this puppy off simply for that reason. But I will also say that after that uh, recent playthrough I had of it, it's... Uh, I don't think it's necessarily my cup of tea. Uh, having experienced a lot of other game systems in the meantime, a lot of game systems, a lot of combat systems uh, of all sorts. So, uh, given that, I would say that it is a classic in its own right. It's definitely, it's definitely an artifact, I'll say that much. But I would not say that it's something that is a must-have uh, by any stretch. If you're looking for something quite different, um, something... It's not quite lightweight, but it's not exactly uh, heavy-duty either in terms of... Uh, brain power or uh, length of time. It does take about, it says, two or three hours to play. I dispute that. I think it's more along the lines of five or six hours. Maybe four hours if you're really proficient at it, uh, which I'm not anymore. Um, so it's a reasonable amount of time, sort of manageable, but it's not short either. So if you're looking for something just plain different, uh, yeah, by all means, give it a go. It's not a huge, not a huge, uh, risk involved. It's not a huge investment for that matter. You can buy this fairly cheaply on eBay or Noble Knight or other places. But if you are uh, looking for an outright game that will cover France in 1944, I would say that there are better titles out there. And so, yeah, that's my overview of, uh, of this game. So if you like this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. As well, have a look at my website, which is www.sologrognard.com. I have it right here in the, in the comment section, so have a look at that. And visit my website, subscribe to my channel. And thank you very much for watching. Again, this is Eric for Solo Grodnard, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye now.